John McCluskey's Alamos Gold has had a blistering 2024, up 55% year to date. John, welcome back to Kiko. Nice to be here. Thank you. Congratulations on the run. Well, it's been uh, been a long time coming, but I think we've got a fantastic gold market and uh, share price is doing really well. I think the story is a growth story at Alamos. Absolutely. And we've been driving it for quite a number of years. You know, the roots to um, the success you see today are actually buried very deeply. And in our case, it starts off with a series of acquisitions we started on in 2015. And uh, now they're starting to really pay off. Um, we were talking earlier, as you said, and it's really been about uh, actually uh, getting assets. Uh, how would you say at places when people, uh, it's, uh, it's a hard time to actually buy an asset? It's a countercyclical strategy, and you would think that would be an obvious approach to take in a, in a cyclical industry. But it's, it's, it's very surprising to me how hard it is to pull that off because generally when the market is very, very bad, the, um, the investor mindset is that it's not going to get any better. You know, it's probably mm -hmm. going to get worse. And, um, you know, we, we had looked at, at the charts like everybody else uh, from Gold's Peak in 2011 mm -hmm. to when we started to, um, you know, seriously put money into acquisitions in 2015. Gold had gone from 1900 down to 1100. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't have to be a genius at reading charts to appreciate that that was, if not the bottom, very close to the bottom. And in fact, that's what it turned out to be. And so between 2015, when uh, we merged together with um, Orico, uh, through 2017, when we acquired Island Gold, we did three acquisitions right along the bottom of the curve. And uh, those three projects are, um, they've turned out extremely well and they're really, they're driving our growth. Bring us through the pipeline right now, uh, John. So you did uh, the Argonaut, um uh, merger that you had in March. Uh, you also have some development projects which are going to be coming online as well too. So what's the production that you have right now and what are we looking at in the years ahead? Right. So currently we produce from our Mulatos mine in Mexico, mm -hmm. which over the last couple of years, it's been producing record cash flow. And that's after 19 years of producing in Mexico. And um, we have a mine called Young Davidson mm -hmm. up near Kirkland Lake, Ontario that produces roughly 200,000 ounces of gold a year. We have um, the Island Gold Mine, which produces at a rate of about 150,000 ounces a year right now. And um, combined, those, uh, those mines are generating, well, last year we did 530,000 ounces a year. And uh, now with the acquisition of Magino, we'll, uh, we'll push our production to closer to, say, 600,000 ounces this year. The, r the run rate is... Um, is all in uh, growth mode now, as you pointed mm -hmm. out. Uh, we are in the process of a, of a big expansion at our Island Gold project, uh, sinking a shaft and um, putting in a, an expanded mill, pay, paste backfill plant, you know, all the, all the components that we would need in order to operate that mine at, a, at twice the current rate. It's currently a 1,200 ton per day mine, but we'll, we'll turn it into a 2,400 ton per day mine. That's uh, slated for completion in uh, first quarter of uh, 2026. But how about this? Um, next door, our neighbors built a mill, a 10,000 ton per day mill, and uh, to serve um, a 10,000 ton per day open pit mining operation. But um, as things turned out, uh, they were struggling with the startup and uh, we started to have discussions and it culminated in, in the acquisition of Argonaut Gold. And uh, that has brought that 10,000 ton per day mill into our, into our hands. And so now we, we, we are looking to unitize that whole camp and effectively take our underground ore from the island side, as well as the open pit ore and put it all through the 10,000 ton per day mill. So that mill expansion we were planning on our side, we don't have to do that anymore. Hmm. And there was also a big tailings lift expansion that was planned for this year, about a $40 million tailings lift expansion. We don't have to do that either. And we'll, we'll consolidate everything into the, um, the, the tailings facility that was on the machinal side of the fence. So these were just extraordinarily, um, you know, good value opportunities for us to take advantage of. And in addition to those, there were, there were quite a number of others. And by the time you added it all up, we had over 500 million 
in synergies by combining those two projects. And that made the, um, that made the acquisition pretty much a no-brainer. How are costs uh, right now? Uh, when I was looking at uh, the interview that you did uh, with my colleague Paul Harris uh, back at BMO as well, too, uh, the word that you used was uh, struggling. Uh, the miners do struggle with costs right now. It seems to be a bit of a less of a story just uh, with these uh, record high gold prices. Um, you know, oil has come off as well, too, but uh, are you still seeing cost inflation? Well, we're seeing some relief, actually, but um, it, it's not always where, where you might think. But like reagent costs, for example, those have, have come down, but labor costs uh, remain high, especially in Canada. And as an industry, I, I probably commented that we struggle a little bit because for the most part, we're price takers. Mm -hmm. And generally, the, the best place we can save going in, this is sort of a point I've made many times over, it's on the acquisition itself. So if you pay up and over the odds for the acquisition, well, you're, you're already starting at a pretty high threshold. And now if you're looking for savings on, say, the capital side or the operating side, that's not going to be very easy. So the, the point I would be trying to make is that you've got to go counter-cyclical. You've got to acquire assets typically um, at favorable prices, um, fair prices, but you know, you've got to buy them in markets where um, they can be obtained on, at, at reasonable costs. And if you can do that um, and then build an operation uh, at a proper scale and the, the proper approach that can effectively um, keep your costs in check, um, then you're going to have a much better chance of being a low cost operator. Now, in the case of Island, for example, you know, we wanted, to, we found so much more in the way of reserves there. It was 1.8 million in all categories when we acquired it. It's over 6 million ounces now, and it's still growing. So it's currently a ramp operation. And the deeper you go with a ramp operation, your costs are going to climb because your haulage is going to go up, the amount of ventilation that you're going to need, you know, your haulage distance, for example. Um, right now, it takes us about an hour to go from mine face to surface. If you're, if you're, if you're going from, say, our current level, 900,000 meters, you go down 17, 1,800 meters, 2,000 meters, and you're ramping up from there, it's going to take literally hours. Mm -hmm. And you're running diesel trucks. It, it's not efficient. You sink a shaft, and you're essentially kind of locking in your costs. You're fixing your costs because you're, now you're sort of operating an elevator as opposed to a stairwell. Mm -hmm. And that's just going to be a lot more efficient. And you also don't you don't have diesel trucks. You're not relying mm -hmm. on you're not relying on uh, fossil fuels. You're not producing all of that uh, exhaust that you've got to ventilate that draws on more power and so forth. All that's gone, and now you're um, you're basically hauling your your ore up through a skip system that is driven off the Ontario power grid, which is hydroelectric power. So you've mm -hmm. taken out the fossil fuels, you've made your operation much more efficient. And in our case, it'll drop our costs down from roughly, well, it was going to be about $1,000 ASIC where they are now. They're going to drop down to about $600 all in sustaining costs, which is a pretty big savings. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about M&A. Um, you know, you're saying that uh, you should be counter cyclical, but uh, it doesn't seem that that's a trend right now. We've seen like a significant amount of uh, M&As that have been both in the gold space and we saw some uh, monster M&A uh, recently happening in the copper space as well too. So mm -hmm. it seems like uh, we're at a point right now, I guess, where, uh, you know, COs are allowed to kind of stick their neck out as well too, but it might, might be the optimal time for doing so. Well, with gold prices running the way they are, I mean, the margins are just phenomenal right now. So you've got that part of it. You've also, um, there's a bifurcation in the market where um, non-producing companies are still lagging in valuation relative to the producers. And that differential in valuation is something that an acquirer can use to make acquisitions, even though the gold price is very high. It hasn't always been that way, you know, in the past, um, I can recall when gold prices started to run, little junior exploration companies used to do really well. You know, we, mm -hmm. we would raise money more easily. Uh, when we produce good results, you know, there's a big retail market that used to respond to those results. Um, it was very different back then, but with the you know, virtual 
disappearance of the retail sector relative to the institutional side and the ETF side, um, it's it's a big big struggle for mm -hmm. for non producers for for exploration companies, and I think you're going to see more deals where producers will be ac acquiring developers. As far as you know, the merger of of two producers that's always going to be difficult to achieve because shareholders are are demanding you know value creation through those mergers and i don't think we've always been that successful as an industry in, in producing that value proposition um you know this that that's why the acquisition of argonaut gold was um was such a standout deal because it was it was very obviously uh, a value proposition for shareholders on both sides um argonaut was struggling away well they got a premium takeout and they got Alamo shares and those shares have gone up. So they've, they've benefited tremendously from that deal. And from our side, the capex of developing that, that expansion project has come way down and uniting that whole camp. I mean, there's just unquestionable synergies and, and value creation that comes out of that whole exercise. And as a consequence, everybody's won on that one. And I think you, it, where those kinds of um, win-win scenarios can evolve from the uh, the mergers. You're going to see them happen. Uh, what's driving uh, the gold price, John? Uh, we've seen that uh, gold prices hit uh, several all-time highs. I think the narrative at the start of the year was uh, Asian buying as well as uh, central bank buying as well too. I've probably seen more articles on gold <laughs> in the last week than I saw in the last three months. You know, even though gold was running, um, the press was largely ignoring it. And suddenly, you know, the Financial Times has got an article on gold. The Wall Street Journal has got an article <laughs> on gold. Everybody's talking about gold all of a sudden. And um, maybe $2,500 was that magic number they were all waiting for. I don't know. But um, the, the, what was behind that move in gold is it, it's been sort of well discussed. And, um, you know, it's been, you know, going back 24 months, say, um, it's been central bank buying, and that's been driven by probably two factors. Uh, one factor has been um, the U.S. dollar and the fact that China was sitting with you know, well over a trillion U.S. dollars. That's pretty heavy exposure to a dollar that looked mm. that looked pretty um, pretty inflated, and um, so they started to sell their gold. Uh, pardon me, sell their dollars and buy gold. That that was definitely happening. Then uh, everybody saw after the invasion of um, the Ukraine by the Russians, there was the, something like three hundred and sixty billion dollars in assets seized. They were shut out of the SWIFT code system. Um, they were they were basically being sort of dictated to like if you're going to misbehave, this is going to cost you, and um, that probably sent a signal right around the globe and all those regimes that are sort of run by, you know, dictatorships, you know, China, mm -hmm. you know, case in point, um, they felt very nervous and said, well, you know, the, the Americans are going to use economic persuasion in order to get us to toe the line. And they didn't like that. And so I think they all started buying gold. And this has been, this has been very, very noticeable. It, it pops up in the press every now and then you'll hear India's bought a lot of gold and Iran's bought gold and Poland's bought gold and mm -hmm. India, China, all, you know, suddenly everybody's buying, all these central banks are buying gold. We haven't seen that kind of central bank buying for 25 years. So that was a big driver until very, very recently, the news came out in the press just over a month ago that the Chinese had sort of backed off their purchases of gold. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know how good that information is, but that's what you read. And then um, what we've seen in the, um, in the meantime is sort of a renewed interest in gold from, say, North American buyers. Because I, it, it, you, know, you brought up earlier in our discussion uh, what a phenomenon it is that all this gold is being purchased at Costco. Mm -hmm. And it's true. I, I, I think articles have popped up here and there that, that say that Costco can't even keep the gold on their shelves as fast as it comes in it's mm. it's out the door and they limit what two bars per customer or something like <laughs> that and i mean it's clearly uh, an indication that uh, there's a big demand for gold and i don't think that's going away anytime soon uh 
There was a report from uh, Reuters uh, in Mexico's uh, lower house of Congress that had approved constitutional reforms that uh, would prohibit uh, open pit mining. You do uh, operate in Mexico. Uh, is it something you're watching? Is it something you're concerned about? Absolutely, I'm watching that very, very closely. We've been um, we've been operating at Mulatos now since uh, we poured our first bar back in 2005, and um, you know we are one of the biggest employers in this part of Sonora State. It, there's no question that um, that the local communities and the local economy thrives on the presence of that mm -hmm. mine. So, you know, if, for example, there was just this blanket ban on open pit mining tomorrow, well, the last of our open pit operations, um, which is slated to continue production until 2027, you could, you could argue, well, that might be closed down in six months time or something like that. Well, that would, that would be, a, that would have a devastating effect on that local community. It would have a modest uh, impact on us as well. I mean, you just can't turn off the tap immediately, but, um, you know, if we had to close that mine down, there's no question that that would, um, you know, that would negatively impact us as a company. I just don't think that's the way it's going to go. Mm -hmm. um, I think even in the case if they were to pass that kind of legislation, which I'm doubtful they will, um, I think they would grandfather certain operations. So existing open pit mines like our La Yaki Grande, mm -hmm. which is a very, very efficient uh, open pit mine. Um, they would allow it to produce until 2027 and then, you know, it would close down and they wouldn't want mm -hmm. us to reopen anything more. We were transitioning to underground mining at Mulatto's anyway. Mm. So for the last two years, we've been working on, um, on drilling sulfide reserves and we, we found a new deposit called PDA. And PDA right now sits at roughly 1.2 million ounces. And uh, we also have another PDA, by the way, runs right off the back of the main Mulatto's pit, but it's mm -hmm. another, it will, we'll have to ramp into it and go underground and it will have to be milled. It won't, there won't be heap leaching in that case. So that big transition was underway for us in any case. So from a long-term perspective operating at Mulatto's, you know, I'm not concerned about that. We would, it, it, at the, in the worst case, we would lose a few years of production from our Layaki Grande operation, but I, I doubt it'll. I doubt it'll ever come to that. I, I would say the companies that are probably a little more nervous are are companies that are trying to permit new open pit operations in in Mexico. But once they think it through, I I, I don't see how a a state of what 125 million people, I don't see how it can operate without open pit mining because as you know, gravel comes from an open pit, clay comes from an open pit. You can't make all those lovely tiles that they tile their homes and restaurants with in Mexico without clay pits. Mm. And um, it, it, Hermosillo, every building in the town of Hermosillo, which is over a million people, they're all built out of concrete. And all that concrete comes from a big plant about an hour outside of town. I've been flying back and forth across that, that big operation for 20 years now. And it's a, it's a great big pit. There's, you know, they're mining, you know, sand and gravel and they're, they're, they're mining uh, lime, limestone. And uh, that's how they produce cement. Mm -hmm. And I don't see how the, the nation of, of Mexico functions without open pits, without <laughs> cement and without uh, clay and, you know, all these very practical things. You can't build roads without gravel. You know, so how are you going to build another road in Mexico? So, you know, they're going to come up to some very sort of practical um, issues. You know, right now, I think you've got a bunch of you know, relatively young, ideological, uh, ide ideologically driven politicians who, you know, now they've got a taste of power. Well, we're going to ban this and we're going to do that. And, and eventually the reality set in of, of what are the actual needs of a modern state and once that starts to um, once that starts to come home to roost, uh, they're they're, they're going to have to recognize that um, that that shutting down open pit mining isn't such a, a good idea after all. Lastly, John, uh, I want to ask you about uh, productivity and technology. Uh, you've been developing mines for a very long time. You're also advancing mines right now. You talked about uh, some of the efficiency changes that have made right now. We see three big trends that are happening within mining. We see electrification, we see automation, and then we see all the advances in IT and then 
use the word, of course, AI right now as well, too. Uh, do you see anything in the future that is going to be very meaningful in terms of productivity for mines? And then, of course, you know, that actually being able to kind of get down costs right now. Absolutely. And really, for us, the, um, the future began in, in 2015 when we, when we took over Young Davidson. Mm -hmm. So that mine was operating from sort of mid-level infrastructure. It was operating at about 3,000 tons a day or so. And um, it was, um, the ore, ore was being handled three times before it, it made its way to surface. Um, it was not a terribly efficient operation. It, 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 was, it was set up um, on a more or less temporary basis to produce cash flows in order to build out the rest of the mine. But with the gold price coming down the way it did, um, they were just not generating enough positive cash flow to get the job done. And that more or less was the impetus behind the merger mm -hmm. with Alamos, which we came in with a $400 million balance sheet. And we had the wherewithal to get things mm -hmm. finished. We weren't going to have to rely on the cash flow from that uh, mid-level infrastructure. Well, now we had an opportunity to conceive of what that mine would look, look like in the long term. And what we did was we fully automated the mine. So instead of ore being hauled across, you know, a, a kilometer underground from where it was being mined at the face over to the uh, ore bins where it would be fed mm -hmm. into the skips and taken to service, we said that's, that's not going to be the way it's going to go. So we basically, we, we now handle the ore once. It comes out of the stope and it goes right into a, an ore pass. And it's gravity fed down into the crusher at depth. So the crusher's down at the 1500 meter level. And then once it's crushed, mm. it's essentially conveyed over to the ore bins where it's gravity fed into the skips and taken to surface. From mm -hmm. the surface, it's, it's, it's dumped into another ore bin and that's gravity fed into a conveyor that takes it right into the mill. So nobody's mm -hmm. touched it since it had been taken out of the stope. And um, the fact that we can automate it is um, it's a lot to do with the way technology has evolved there's no there's no point along that entire system that we don't monitor you know it's all very carefully monitored and we can observe from surface we've got it all under camera we know what volume is moving we know when it's moving we know when mm -hmm. it stops you know there's we can keep an eye on everything as it moves throughout that whole system that's really quite remarkable. And that's, that's now, that's like a 21st century mine. What we took over was, say, the way a mine would have probably operated in, in 1980 or something like that. And, um, or you, you might not have seen anything very different even in 1950. But what we're doing today, you couldn't have built that. The, um, you know, the software just, it just wasn't there. Uh, where we're seeing things like AI helping us is uh, on the exploration side of things. Exploration is all about big data, right? mm -hmm. you know, whether you're getting it from drill holes, where you're getting it from airborne, you've got all this data. Now, if you could feed it into a system that was able to calculate and draw conclusions in hours that would typically take a team of geologists weeks or months, um, that gives you a, a big advantage. And that's typically how we're using AI. Um, we see a, a big advantage in, um, this, this is in our Canadian underground operations. Big advantage of, of getting away from uh, from fossil fuel fuels altogether, and um, and re relying on grid power. And this is the one of the chief impetus behind uh, sinking a shaft at our at our Island Gold operation. So we're going to do something very similar at Island Gold to what we did at Young Davidson. You know, right now it's all haul trucks taking the ore to surface. That won't be the case in the future, you know. We're, so we're not going to go from, you know, diesel haul trucks to electric haul trucks, which is a, a big struggle anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, we're simply going to go to a shaft. Mm -hmm. The trouble why everybody doesn't do that is in order to justify that amount of capital, you have to build up a big enough reserve that you can have confidence in, in order to invest that three quarters of a billion dollars in that expansion. And that's what we did in our case. We, between 2017 and 2022, we drilled off 5 million ounces of gold. And that gave us the wherewithal to put in front of the market our phase three expansion. And that was shifting the whole operation from these diesel trucks running up and down ramps 
to a shaft operation, which will automate in a in very similar fashion to what we did at, uh, at Young Davidson. And uh, the net result of that is our costs are going to come down by roughly 40%. And our production is going to go up from this 150,000 ounce a year rate to about 300,000 ounces a year. John, congratulations for you taking Alamos Gold. Thank you. My name is Michael McRae. You're watching Kitco Mining.